Me, um, Salvatore Kessi, Sandeep Chavda, and Mona Mlauer, they are going to introduce themselves later just to save time. So I also have my colleague um, that I am with, uh, we're studying together in the UK, our master's in computer science, um, Sia. Sia, you can just say hi because she's not part of the speakers. You can just unmute and say hi to everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hope you're all Hi. good. Okay. So I'll basically focus on um, the introduce the speakers. So I'm going to focus on the exams in general. And I believe all this information we can get from the IFOA websites. And um, Salvatore is going to walk us through another way of getting exemption and smart class opportunities and tuition classes. Well, Sandeep and Mona are going to walk us through the industry experience and career advice. So roughly there are foundation level exams that are generally um, set by the IFOA. And I believe most of these are actually covered while we study our Bachelor of Science from the University of Dar es Salaam or Institute of um, IFM. So I'll just briefly walk you through CS1 and CS2. Um, CS1 basically concentrates on probability and mathematical statistics, uh, but both of these CS1 and CS2 involve a paper two of our programming um, ex online exam, which you also have to sit um, and you also have to be knowledgeable a bit of R as well to be able to sit for that exam. While CM1 and CM2, CM1 mainly focuses on the financial mathematics and life contingencies, which I believe, again, we cover a lot of that. Uh, and both of CM1 and CM2 um, also involve a paper two of Excel exam, um, which, again, you also have to be knowledgeable of how to use um, your Excel. Well, CB1, CB2, and CB3, um, these are basically business exams and um, CB1 and CB2, again, are most of the FN um, subjects we cover from UDism. So just to note is that um, these two are also basics of what we cover. So just to note generally, all these exams, especially CS1 to CS2, are basically the basics of what we cover um, in our university courses. And I have a testimony of um, getting an exemption of CB1, uh, I and Sia, and, and, uh, and our other colleague as well. So there are three of us who got an exemption just by matching our course outlines um, from University of Dar es Salaam with the CB1 IFOA um, syllabus. Um, for that particular exam. So I believe you can move ahead and even ask for exemption of other exams. But again, it's all about just having the course outlines from your studies and combining all those courses that you think have, uh, they do match with the IFOE syllabus for that particular exam. So, and apart from that, all these are just the foundations of what we cover in, in, in our universities. Um, CB3 is um, quite an expensive exam, but again, it's an online uh, based sort of assessment rather than an exam because you're set in groups with other people from other nations. And basically what they assess you individually and in that group work is your understanding of the professionalism and how you should work uh, as an actuary, especially your knowledge around the codes of conduct. Um, just moving ahead, um, the associateship, um, apart from those foundation level exams they involved in these three exams, they are quite um, heavy, but they require you to, you know, um, be able to generate ideas around the actuarial practice, the financial industry, and such stuff. So as you move along, you'll be following up on what is required in each of these um, exams. Under this fellowship principles, you need two, um, two exams and you definitely will be able to combine. Um, so you could go say for SP1 and SP2, if you want to say be a health um, actuary based or life insurance based actuary, um, you'll definitely say choose pension 
<laughs> and any other, um, if you want to say be a pensions actuary, you will definitely want to combine CSP5 and SP6. It's not required, but to just match the two, you could make a combination of any of this, but the, the, the requirement is you sitting any two out of these um, exams. Um, the other last exam they require from me is the fellowship advanced. So you will have to choose one from this one. So say you sat for general insurance, reserving and capital modeling and general insurance pricing under fellowship principles. I think you'll definitely want to move ahead to SA3, which is general insurance and uh, you'll qualify from there. And other considerations are just a few things I wanted to mention that you could um, do things like there are things required like PPD, which is personal and professionalism development and continuing professional development. These ones we find even in other qualifications, say like CPA, CCA, CFA. So they are common things um, from associations. And you can also look into these ones as you move along with your qualifications because it's also a requirement. And volunteering and events, um, these are things uh, FOA also provides or they make them available for you to just you know, link up with other people um, who are part of the FOA as well. And I want to touch on the membership where you could sit for CS1, which is the actuarial statistics, the basic mathematics um, and probability statistics exam and CM1, which is the financial mathematics and life contingencies exam without being a member. Uh, while you could, if you want to sit for any other exam apart from this two, then you have to be a member. And for example, if you want to sit for an exam in September, then you can, you have to register to be a member um, before 18th June, 2021 this year. So if you, if you do not want to sit for any other exam and you just want to give a try first, you could definitely sit for these ones without being a member because there is definitely a membership fee that you have to pay. And apart from the membership fee, I think last time I checked it was around 200 pounds. And, but you'll have an annual subscription fee to pay every year around 73. So these are just things to note as you move along with your career. Um, lastly, I just wanted to also give you a snapshot of various costs, and these are reduced rate fees. Um, in the non-member, non-members CS1 and CM1 exams, you could sit for them at 200 pounds, while the rest, once you're a member, you could definitely sit for them at this cost. But if you are able to get exemptions, say from the University of Dar es Salaam or Institute of Finance um, Man Management IFM, then you can, you'll, ha you'll have to pay again this. So it's not free. That's the point. Uh, yeah, so all these things, I'll share links later because most of these informations are actually uh, the same things we have in their website. So I'll hand over to Salvatore um, to, to move along. And after him, um, Sandeep and Mona will actually, Sandeep will follow and Mona will, will finish up later. Then we'll have a section on questions. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Nemo, for an incredible uh, presentation. Um, thanks a lot myself. I'm still learning a lot from that. <clears throat> so I'm um, Salvatore and um, I'm currently uh, doing a P uh, my PhD in actuarial science, and uh, I will just share with you briefly um, about my journey, which is on how to get exempt, exempted from some exams, and then um, our program, which aims to help uh, most of you guys to complete your exams um, uh, directly from uh, doing the, the, the papers. So, uh, so as Nema mentioned uh, earlier, uh, there is an option where you can you can like get exempted like without doing the exam. One is uh, by doing your let's say undergrad or your masters from uh, a credible, I mean, uh, like in university which is like um, certified uh, or accredited by um, IFO, I, 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 uh, or A, right? 
the Institute of Actuary. So myself, I was a little bit fortunate to do my master's from University of Southampton. And from there, what you need to do is like, you have to like uh, make sure you, you pass the, the course at, uh, at a certain um, level. And from there you can request this uh, exemption from uh, the Institute of uh, Actuary. And uh, you will get exempted based on like uh, the pass mark. And also, you'll be uh, exempted um, after after you manage to like first pay for your membership, as Nema mentioned, which is a one-off payment. And secondly, you need to make sure that Lenovo can you turn off. Hello, someone is uh, unmuted. Please, can you mute someone? Lenovo, can you mute, please? So that, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so you can get exempted after, like, you, you have achieved the a certain uh, pass mark. And in order to get exempted, means you need to first be the member of IFO, which means you have to apply for membership and you have to pay a one-off payment. And also for each exemption, you also have to pay a certain amount of money. Which I remember for myself, it was around like maybe seven hundred pounds for all the exemption, eight exemptions. Yeah, so in order to take this uh, route of uh, getting exemptions means that after your undergrad, let's say from IFOM or from EDISM, you can probably apply for scholarships. And there are a couple of scholarships such as Commonwealth and Chevenin. And if you're lucky to get one, then, and you do master's in actual science, then you'll be able to get these exemptions. Yeah, so that's pretty much about how you can get exempted uh, by doing your master's or undergrad from a uh, university that they are accredited by the Institute of Actuaries. But alternatively, I guess Nema mentioned a bit about also doing your undergrad from UDSM or IFM, you can also get exempted given that you have reached a certain pass mark and you can convince IFO that what you covered from your undergrad or from your course is exactly what they offer in, in, into their like exams. So I think pretty much NEMA can help you guys on NEMA and CAGS. They can help you directly on how you can do this. So maybe after here you can read them. Um, alternatively, uh, we can qualify by doing the exams directly. And uh, basically doing the exams directly is pretty hard uh, in terms of like, you, you need a lot of preparation, you need a lot of uh, people around you to be able to go through these exams. So because of that, uh, we at Smart Class, we decided to like um, prepare a, a program that will help those who are interested to do exams to be uh, given like very intensive tutorial help from like uh, people like who have done these exams before and probably they are almost uh, qualified or they're about to qualify. So um, yeah, so shortly we will um, announce this. And um, what we're thinking right now is like, we, we're gonna talk to some few uh, stakeholders such as AST and some like big companies to kind of like fund a little bit this. I mean, like at least to give uh, like the, the total some, some just small money to just keep them motivated. But also we, we're thinking of like, maybe students, they can also contribute a little bit on that just to get uh, like the, the, the tutorial help uh, whereby you can like get uh, well prepared for these exams. So even if you are not going to get a scholarship, you can still qualify by doing the exams directly. And this time around, it's gonna be pretty much uh, easy because you'll you'll have like a help from people who have done exams before and they, they're gonna guide you through and um, make you like uh, increases your chances of passing the exams. And all this will be done uh, like mostly online. So just to make sure that it's convenient for like almost everyone to join, because I know soon you go, you're gonna be starting your jobs and you'll be like a little bit tight, but we hope by offering uh, a more flexible option like online classes for these tut uh, tutorials, for exams, it will be a little bit uh, useful. So that's all. If you will have any question, you can drop it in the chat and I will be happy to respond to it. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Neymar. Um, thank you. Um, Sandeep, um, you can go ahead.
Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nema. Thank you, Cassie. Um, well, uh, my name is uh, Sandeep Chabda. Um, I'm currently working at APSA Bank Tanzania. Uh, for those of you uh, who know me, and uh, uh, I'm here to talk about um, career advice rather and to explain my journey from where I began uh, to where I am right now. And I would want this to be a very engaging session. So I look forward to questions at the end of the session where I think maybe uh, the students can can ask uh, uh, deeper into how our career has been navigated to, to reach here where we are. So basically, I studied uh, uh, PCM uh, from five, from six. Then I went ahead and did my uh, bachelor's in actuarial uh, science from the University of Cape Town. Uh, I studied from 2006 to 2009. Uh, thereafter, in 2010, I joined uh, Heritage Insurance. Uh, I worked there as an underwriter. So the basic work that I got started off is actually writing uh, insurance stickers for for clients. You know, uh, basic items. And <clears throat> the initial impression was a bit weird for me. Uh, you know, uh, joining. An organization, you know, at that time, any any graduate would think uh, that uh, you know you've completed an actuarial science degree. It's quite new in the market. You know, there's high demand for it. And how come I'm here? You know, writing insurance stickers, uh, looking at people's cars, opening you know, opening their bonnets, and taking pictures of their engines uh, to write the chassis number. So that's the most basic job that I started with. And I used to hate it because then I thought maybe what's my degree for? You know, I studied uh, complicated actuarial models, but I'm here writing, you know, insurance stickers, and it's something that I hated every day. But not realizing that it's building me up, uh, getting to understand the insurance operations, customer challenges. Uh, these are only realizations that you'll get after a couple of years of working. And you know, when you are assigned a bit uh, senior role uh, as you move up middle management into senior management is when you realize how important those building blocks were. So my first advice to students who are listening today is whatever sort of jobs that you get as soon as you graduate, as long as, uh, or at least if they are in the insurance industry or in the actuarial domain, uh, take them up. Do not uh, do not worry about your future too much yet initially. Get a get a foothold into the company, and then that's where you progress. And also demonstrate to your to your management your your capabilities. Perhaps they already know uh, the best use of uh, actual resources by now at least. But if they don't, then you need to be out there, you know, helping, analyzing, producing uh, better reports so that they can see value and then they will automatically give you tasks that are relevant for you so that you can you know upgrade your your career and that's how i moved so <clears throat> uh, i worked for heritage for about three years until 2013 and uh, then i got a job offer from a new uh, life insurance company that started up in tanzania uh, metropolitan insurance it was there as a general insurance company before but then uh, the life insurance company started. So that's when I got my first actual uh, exposure to more uh, actual work per se. So initially it was more of underwriting, you know, and then I used to do a bit of actual analysis for heritage back then, but then it was not proper core actual work. So until I joined uh, Metropolitan Life is then uh, my CEO was uh, qualified actually, actually, so he, he really understood uh, how to develop us, uh, what sort of tasks to give us. And uh, uh, his name was Kelvin Messingham at the time. He was the CEO of Metropolitan Life. So a very good gentleman. Uh, uh, we then uh, I my, my role was basically into pricing uh, group life insurance products, uh, group credit life. So that's when I got exposure into how to price life insurance products. I got to do uh, reinsurance as well, and I learned a lot of things. 
and then eventually in my journey with Metropolitan, I got a senior role into becoming the head of operations. So I managed overall operations, then I had staff under me. So that's when I gained management level skills as well. So that's when I became a manager, uh, where now there are staff who are reporting to me. So that's when you can see your actual uh, core skills. Uh, you're not just a technical person, but as you grow, you, you need to learn management skills as well, where you're managing people, uh, motivating them. So this is the journey that uh, you would want to see uh, as a student uh, for yourself to grow from a technical person, perhaps right to a CEO, uh, you know, one day becoming a board member at the end of the day and a shareholder sometimes. So that's a journey we all aspire to. So I worked for Metropolitan for about seven years until uh, last year in 2020. I got a job offer as uh, head of bank assurance for Absa Bank Tanzania, uh, where we basically the bank started uh, insurance agency operations because of the new regulatory license that was uh, given and because of the new regulations that came out that allowed banks to now operate as an agent. So I got a chance to, to lead a team, uh, to, to head a department. So you can see the journey, uh, a 10 or 11 year journey, uh, writing stickers uh, for, 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 for clients, right up to heading and, and insurance uh, agency uh, within a bank. And there's more to come. And, and I keep on learning from every single individual. Uh, you'll be surprised that I still learn from the trainees who come uh to join for field training you know there's always something to learn so that's one aspect uh, in my career that i always stick to that you should be always open uh, to learn from anyone that is you know it could be about actual it could be about life it could be about anything so uh, your mindset should be always open that you could learn anything from anyone and that's how you grow so that's where i am right now um, I'll talk about my, my, my role uh, in a while, but I just want to cover uh, some aspects of um, actual practice when it comes to students who have a different option. Okay, so uh, Nema had asked me to talk about where uh, actuaries can work in Tanzania. So you can work obviously in an insurance company. Uh, you have general insurance companies, you have medical insurance companies, and you have life insurance companies. All of these are now accepting uh, actual graduates. And I've recently seen a post on our actual society WhatsApp group. Uh, someone posted about uh, TIRA wanting two actual officers. So it, it's a progress. Uh, you can see now even the regulator will, will be expanding the scope as we go into much, much more sophisticated uh, regulatory uh, regimes where actual practice is required even at uh, individual companies and i think this is going to come into force by the end of this year where the regulation have already changed uh, requiring all insurance companies to have an actual department so <clears throat> definitely there will be a need in the insurance area uh, then there's pensions as well uh, in particular defined benefit schemes uh, defined benefit schemes are, are where more core actual work is required uh, on, 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 on defined contribution schemes, not really, because uh, the contributions are fixed. You don't need to worry too much about how much uh, surplus or, or the effect is. So your focus basically becomes on investments. So for those of you who are good at investments and uh, those area, then they are suitable for defined contribution. But uh, we do not have defined contribution in Tanzania as mandatory schemes. So all our schemes are defined benefit schemes. Therefore, actual work is definitely required. Um, then we have areas like consulting. Uh, you can work for a consulting firm. You have top four, uh, the big four, they call them KPMG, uh, Ernst & Young, Deloitte, uh, PwC. And then we have other uh, upcoming consulting firms that uh, are in Tanzania now who are actual consulting firms. I've heard of the likes of uh, ARC, uh, who's, which is led by um, Sadi Shemliwa, then there's Kenbright, then there's Tanganyika. Uh, so, so there's a lot of firms in Tanzania that are coming up, which is quite good for our market. Uh, 
brings about competition. It brings about uh, employment opportunities for our graduates. So I think that's a good thing. And that's one area where you can work as well, or even aspire to, to, to have your own consulting firm in the near future. So, so this is something definitely uh, you can participate in. Then there is uh, data science and analytics. Uh, as part of your actual career, you can even uh, opt for this field as well. And there's a lot of scope for that. Uh, it could be in other industries as well that require heavy use of data. Um, let's say uh, the airline industry, uh, the telecoms industry, and even within the telecoms industry, I've seen uh, insurance roles as well. Uh, we have someone called uh, Melchizedek Nyau, uh, who has been in the insurance industry. He started working uh, as my staff uh, at Metropolitan, but now he's heading uh, the insurance uh, at Vodacom. And you've seen the good things Vodacom has done recently in partnership with Britain. They've rolled out a product uh, to buy insurance through their phone, the USSD. So you can see developments happening on the mobile network operators as well. So that's an area where you can work as well. Uh, the other area where you can work is uh, research and statistics. Uh, in there's, there's, there's plenty. There's government organizations, there's NGOs. Um, uh, that's an area where you can work. Uh, the other one is uh, banking, uh, where I am. But my role is not on actuarial per se, uh, although there are banks that do employ act actuarial uh, people uh, for specific tasks like credit risk analysis, uh, enterprise risk management. So these are different roles within the bank that uh, actually would really help, uh, especially on the credit risk modeling side. So <clears throat> I'll come to, to my role at the bank. Uh, maybe many people would want to know what I do uh, having an actuarial background and how does that fit into a bank? So my role is not really actuarial per se. I don't do actuarial calculations at the bank, uh, but uh, the, the career journey, the, the courses, the exams, all the things that has made you what you are right now uh, with the uh, analytics uh, skills that has developed in you are the, are the things that are helping me uh, better manage uh, a department. So when it comes to maybe interactions with stakeholders, uh, you look at things analytically, but also on the technical side of things, when there are discussions about new product development, there is a lot of uh, background that I come with and I can defend with as well. You know, So having an actual background when I'm developing a product, it's not something that I hear from the insurance companies themselves when they just present a product and I have to accept it. I can challenge each and every aspect because I have an actual background. I can challenge the scope. I can challenge the terms and conditions. I can challenge the price. I can even challenge the reinsurance structure. You know, sometimes they can tell me, uh, oh, this reinsurer is not uh, accepting our terms. I can always guide them on how else to restructure their insurance to, to better accommodate the risks. So you can see there's a lot of uh, input that you can give. Uh, having a wider view because you have the actual view as well. Now you can you can you can do that. But then again, your your analytic skills helps you uh, plan a lot of things, especially uh, formulating strategies. So my my biggest role is to make sure we do a lot of business. So my time gets spent on uh, creating strategies for sales and business development and how we can grow an entire business and to manage a strategy execution to put people resources time you know it compliance marketing uh, all of these things require really good analytic skills it requires a lot of idea generation so if you have done a course or an exam like cp1 actual practice i think Nema mentioned it's basically an exam that tests your ability to generate ideas in one of the in one of the questions that I did in one of the exams, although I've failed the exam twice, I've not passed it yet. Uh, perhaps Mona, who, who might have passed it, uh, will, will tell us more about it. But it's an exam that requires really to generate ideas. We had a question about uh, space and NASA in, in one of that actual exam where we had to uh, give ideas about what are the things that we need to, to manage as risk if we are developing a space shuttle. 
So that was one of the exam questions. So you can see those uh, those exams uh, give you that ability to develop an idea generating machine in your head. And those are the things that really help you when it comes to solving uh, business development uh, problems here. And basically, yeah, uh, my Excel skills are also helping me uh, manage a uh, lot of things uh, that are not really typical in a banking environment. Sometimes your formulas uh, that you've learned are really helpful when it comes to analyzing a lot of data uh, at the bank. For example, at a bank level, we have a lot of uh, data on customers and we want to analyze perhaps uh, what product should we target or what, what are the types of clients that we need to focus on. So fortunately, uh, being, being part of APSA Bank Tanzania, uh, the, the headquarters is in South Africa and they are also quite very intelligent when it comes to, to using data for banking products as well. So uh, you, can, you can hear people talking about uh, propensity models developed which, uh, which use mathematics to determine uh, who are the most likelihood clients who will buy a certain product based on certain behavior or previous past history. So predictive models per se. So I'm sure some of you might have heard about predictive models. Uh, so those are the models that the bank uses to, to determine what banking products to sell and who to sell to. So that's where you can now come in as well when I sell insurance products now and you, you get to interact on an actual basis as well. So those are the areas basically uh, where, where I come in. Uh, but of course, my journey now is to, to develop myself uh, with, with management and leadership skills so that I can grow into a much larger role uh, in the near future. So that's basically it uh, from me for now. Uh, but I look forward to very good and interesting questions from, from students. Thank you. And I hand over to you, Nema. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. I'll just let on more now because she has somewhere else to be, and then we'll we'll go on with the discussion afterwards. Uh, Mona. I was trying to figure out how to unmute this. Oh, okay. thank you so much for your talk, and uh, Nema. First of all, I want to talk about Nema. Nema downplays herself. She is the lead representative for the. Global Student Consultative Forum with the IFOA. If you have any issues, the IFOA will direct you to Neema. So use her as a key resource. You have her here at Namdarao Darao, but she's a very big deal with the IFOA. So um, I just wanted to talk about my career path. Unfortunately, my, fortunately, unfortunately, I have an accounting and marketing background, um, and then I ventured into um, mathematics, and then I moved into a master's in actuarial science, and then a master's in actuarial management. So that's how I qualified as an associate. Although I still needed to do one more exam, um, which uh, CP2. Sandeep spoke about CP1, how he, he didn't do so well. I know a lot of people struggle with exams. The, I don't like to use the word failing, uh, not getting the pass mark in a derail sana. It's very demotivational. You get very sad and you don't really want to proceed. I just want to point out that this is part of life. Um, everybody goes through this. I personally did CM2 three times. It's only the fourth time that I passed the exam. I have another colleague who did CP1 six times. It's only the seventh time that she passed and she's now a qualified fellow of the I4A. So these exams take resilience and the receipts are there for a reason. So don't let them derail you. Um, the people that qualified, qualified there, wow, so I think this is very crucial. Most people don't like talking about the failures. I think it's very important to talk about the failures because that's the only time when you can actually sit down and reflect. Uh, time is not on my side. So I just want to talk about two things. Number one, the modern actuary has room to work in post-COVID. Uh, the IFOA just launched a webinar series that talks about solely uh, the modern actuary post-COVID area. I'll link it down here. I think this is something very important that everybody should um, look into and it's free. You don't have to pay for it. I think it's going to go on for a good two weeks. So they have like different research areas. They have healthcare, they have pensions, they have general, all geared towards um, 
post COVID. You see right now what we do, especially with the actuarial field, we work mostly in compliance. We need to change this. We need to change the narrative. Where there is risk, there's opportunity. We need to be able to do things, especially in our markets in Tanzania. There is so much we can do. We can be, we can build new products which are innovative, like the uh, what is this? Drive pay as you go driving, wearable technology. So I think the modern actuary needs to work on research and reading. There's a lot of resources on LinkedIn as well. I'll link them all down here so, so that we can all be on the same page. Um, what else I want to talk about? Yes, I want to talk about the IFOA database. They have a great database with research papers and um, past exams. I think this is something that we, we, we tuna, tuna lag behind. I think we, if we work towards this, we can be really, really far. There's so many resources. Neema is a resource, Sandip is a resource, Salvatore is a resource. I'm here, my email is always open. Anytime you can email me, I'm always happy to help. So it shouldn't, be, there is absolutely no reason why we cannot qualify. Um, in Tanzania right now, there's working in consultancy. Sa Sandip spoke about everything. <laughs> even see what else I can talk about. He, he did an amazing job. So we can work in consultancy. We work in the government now. We work in pensions, insurance. Um, I want to talk about uh, the, the roles that you can do with yourself. You need to do self-development. LinkedIn is a great, great, great resource. There's somebody on there who calls himself Pro Actuary. I think his name is Mark Farrell. I, I'm pretty sure most people are aware of him. His blog is something that I rely on. When I make presentations for clients, I log onto his blog. So most of the things, yes, you learn on the job, but you need to do a lot of uh, self-learning, self-development. I cannot stress this enough. So I will link everything down here below. I'm so sorry, I wish I could, spoke, I could speak some more, but I really, really have to go. It's already three o'clock. But I will definitely link everything here. Even if I don't get the time, I will leave it to Nema. Nema is a great resource, use her. The IFOA acknowledges her. We need to acknowledge her as well. Thank you, Anna. Asante sana for your few great points. Thank you. You can definitely go ahead. Um, we are grateful and we'll keep in touch. Um, so, I'll the, okay, we'll move on to the question section. And if you guys have any questions directly, um, on industry and experiences and stuff. Um, we have Salvatore and Sandeep here, they'll cover that. Please feel free to unmute and ask questions about exams, about IFOA, about anything, and we'll do our best to cover. I and Sia will do the more of what the IFOA can, can has um, for us. And I can see a question already here. I would like to know if one passes the CA exams in how get exempted from attending some IFO exams. Yes. So I didn't cover CA. Um, any other question? Hello? Yeah, um, actually. You, yes, CA is a shorter way um, as well. It's another way that you can qualify and it's great. Um, I didn't have enough time to cover that, but I'll just share a link that you can see that relates the FOA exams to the CA exam. So that PDF will definitely give you enough information. But um, as I'm waiting for your questions, please free to unmute. I would like to acknowledge the presence of various people um, in here and that I can see. Um, most of us are our teachers, our great alumni. Uh, at least I can note those whose faces I can see here. I can see Shilingi and Isa. Um, yeah, at least those two. So if you guys unmute and just say hi, Shilingi and, and Isa, please. Hello, everyone. Oh, great. Hi. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Nema. Um, my name is Isa Kisongo, and of course, I work for the Heritage Insurance Company Tanzania Limited. 
as a deputy manager risk management. Uh, I'm also uh, handling a actuarial project under the umbrella of the Association of Tanzania Insurer. And also uh, I work for Africa College of Insurance and Social Protection as a head of reinsurance, complex risk, climate and new frontier. So when you talk about climate today, the job of cyclone is actually our, our things to, to handle. And of course, I'm also a smart class tutor. I do advanced Excel and R classes within a smart class platform. So just to share my journey and what uh, my colleague have already said, Sandeep, uh, Mona, and yourself, Nema, and Salvatore, to add up is just to, is more of, uh, to have discipline on whatever that you are doing. And I've seen the, the job advert uh, that the Tanzania Insurance Regulatory Authorities are uh, actually seeking for two uh, actuarial offices. So I was lucky, uh, we, we were taking five of us from the University of Dar es Salaam to join the role by that time, back in 2015. So uh, we were five of us, but now they have remained only four. So uh, because I left back in 2019. So it is a very uh, proper way or proper path for any actuarial uh, aspirant because you'll be exposed to a lot of things. Because TIRA, let's say uh, they have some stakeholders on the banking side, the entire financial sector, you'll be exposed there on what external uh, market is look like and so on. So I'll be very, very happy to assist anyone to give the details on what is to be expected on that particular role and what are actually um, even the conversation and everything so that you, you'll be uh, conversant on what you are going to, to face. And most important, it, uh, it is a role that it will build you uh, from the scratch. And I'm telling you, I'm here be, uh, because of that role. Um, because I was exposed to the extent that uh, it was massive because uh, as part of the experience, uh, I was appointed as a manager when I was 26. And it's not something that uh, comes to most of people. Uh, of course, I managed people uh, having an average uh, years of, uh, let's say 35 to 40. And by that time, I was 26. So I, I had like uh, seven to eight people to manage. And I was reporting to the director of licensing and market conduct supervision. And in most cases, or uh, in selected cases, I report directly to the commissioner. And in that particular area, it's not only about actual, okay? It's not all about statistics and everything. It's leadership. It's how you, you're capable to manage uh, people's relations. It's uh, how are you going to multitask, to communicate with clients, to manage pressures, and so on. So that are the other soft skills which are very critical when it comes to actuary works. Because uh, actuary works need to be communicated to other non-mathematical people. So you really need to have other soft skills the disciplines to manage uh, people relations and so on. So as you can see, uh, Sandeep has ended up doing uh, business development, okay? He's, uh, actuarial, he has a theory background, but for bank assurance, what they, they actually look, is not actually a technical skill. They are looking, what business can you bring? But of course, you cannot uh, bring any kind of business. That's where uh, the technical skills come. So. Also, we need to have that marketing sense and other soft skills which are very, uh, are very critical uh, uh, for increasing your employability. And of course, uh, I don't know what else to share, but uh, I'm open and free. And despite of having a lot of issues, of course, I'm also working with uh, Mona. We have a project with the Association of Tanzania Insurer. We are reviewing the current rate for general and medical. So I am the project coordinator and Mona is lead consultant. It's very happy to work with a person that you know, with a similar background, you talk the same language and everything. So I wish uh, it's 
most of us within this market because I know our minds are actually uh, brilliant when it comes to, to, to business. So thank you so much. I'll just write up my email and number. Of course, most of people have it, but I'll just write it again on the chat box so that we can keep in touch uh, for career advice and everything. So in case you want to know about the tier roles, what to be expected, uh, what are you going to do uh, and everything, just uh, check on me and I'll be happy to share. Thanks. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Isa. And thank you, Shilingi. We appreciate um, your presence despite um, where, where you are. And so, um, guys, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute. I have been told some are in groups, so there could be more people who have joined us. But um, yeah, so feel free to ask any questions. We are here for you. Maybe can I ask a question while they are waiting? Like uh, I have a question to Sandeep. Uh, Sandeep, you, you spoke a bit about um, defined benefit and defined contribution uh, plans. So uh, myself and um, my colleagues here at uh, UNSW, we, we do a lot of uh, work on longevity and trying to, of course, try to develop new ways of um, uh, people financing their retirement other than uh, defined benefit, which is probably it's no longer it's no longer working here, right? So I wonder first of all, like if there are any first any indicator of longevity risk present in like the uh, Tanzania uh, market, as well as uh, how do you see uh, like uh, this this uh, defined benefit? Uh, uh, strategy next say five years or ten thanks uh thanks Kese. that's a wonderful question um if, if you look at the uh, the trends in the developed countries uh most of them these days prefer a, a defined a contribution scheme so people are moving away from defined benefit and moving towards defined contribution but Tanzania, the way we are used to from the past, and people are very, very sensitive to, to pensions. Eh? Yeah. Uh, later, you should have pension uh, in the parliament. You will see a lot of uproar. You'll, you'll hear a lot of things in the media. Uh, recently, there was talks about the harmonization. So there have been a lot of things in, in, in political sense. Uh, with pension. So to move away to defined contribution, I do not think it will be an easy task. You know, yeah. it a lot of effort, it will need a lot of uh, lobbying and perhaps maybe to show benefit or to show cause as to why we should move towards that. Because basically you're transferring the risks from, from, the, from the scheme to the members uh, because now it's all dependent on the market's performance. Uh, not to say that our markets are not performing. Uh, generally, we have been blessed with a lot of resources. So Tanzania is likely to do well economically uh, amongst African countries because we are blessed with the resources. Uh, we have good political leaders now uh, who, who have a better sense of where we are headed. Uh, they govern us uh, really well. Uh, we have become a middle-income country. So investments-wise, you can see even in the treasury bonds, we have better we have better rates uh, that means the government is able to to at least uh, pay th those coupons meaning there are better returns they must be getting out of the tax revenue collections and stuff like that so even in terms of longevity you we have seen hospitals clinics being built so definitely there's a there's a risk that people will, will outlive uh, will definitely improve in terms of uh, uh, the longevity uh, I, we are expected to live longer as we progress as the tanzanian society uh, grows uh, therefore the pension risk uh, definitely remains so it would definitely be wise to to move towards uh, a contribution scheme where we are uh, relying on the investments generated uh, out of uh, the the contributions people have done 
rather than defined benefit you know because people are going to be living longer and will need to pay a lot of lot more pensions so i don't know if i've answered your question but i think uh, i think the reliance is on 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 politics now to to see if it's moving there yeah uh, thanks thanks a lot son if i uh, i guess even here it's it's spread political and very sensitive issue so if we touch even just a single number on the let's say formula <laughs> it will be like everywhere with a lot of discussions and stuff yeah but i think it's it's i guess it's it's um it's political but at the same time i think we, we have to be realistic with uh trends because at the end of the day i i think the, the cost will be will out um outweigh the the politics because uh, pretty much everywhere people they are suffering in big countries they are they are losing a lot because uh at some point we might fail to really pay out uh, this stuff but maybe it might take some time but i think it's time maybe to prepare and be ready for for that yeah it's also good you asked this question it uh, it, it will bring awareness to students who are listening that this is an an, an issue uh, at least when they get a chance to work with pensions at least this is something that they talk about you know these are we, we are the people who will who will bring the change uh so definitely it's good that you have put this seed into the mindset of the students so yeah. so thank you kesti cheers uh, sandeep thanks for, for the feedback uh, and and the, and i guess it's it's pretty interesting because like it might seems um you guys you're still enjoying this uh you, you can't feel the longevity risk because of like the market returns they pretty pretty uh i mean they they're still very big like 15% plus compared to here where you get like like pretty much like something like very very small in such a way that investment on like things like bonds or stocks or they they don't work out so it's still a, like very hard question whether is the problem coming from people living long or is the problem coming from like investment not working like banks giving like very small rates so yeah it's something interesting to look at it very uh, closely and see where is the problem coming from Okay, thanks a lot. Um, thank you, thank you, guys. Um, so there's also another question here for the interest of time. Um, my question is: After we graduate, what fields can we work before pursuing a career? So, I think we have covered this pretty much. But for just in summary, maybe Sandy, back to you. What was the question again? Um, after I graduate, what fields can we work before pursuing actual exams? So I guess. What roles? Uh, let me just look at the chat screen. Okay, so as soon as you graduate, the fields that you can work in are, are like I mentioned earlier. Uh, it, it's irrelevant whether. uh it's before you are doing the exams or whilst you're doing the exams you know as soon as because your question is like that you you're saying that you've already graduated to so assume you mean that you've graduated from an actual degree or maybe a statistics or mathematical degree with maybe uh exams done or not done but uh the fields that you can work in are like i said insurance uh banking pensions uh research and development in areas of uh, statistics you can work in consulting firms so reinsurance companies as well uh, uh mobile network operators in 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 areas like enterprise risk management uh or or just risk management areas uh, even within the bank you can work within credit risk you can work in a risk department um insurance companies we have 30 insurance companies in Tanzania we have one reinsurance company so there's plenty of opportunities uh, fields or companies that you can say in Tanzania that you can work in yeah thank you sandeep i think that's that's a good answer response um if there are any further questions um anyone else with a question so we can close I'm sure there must be a lot of questions. I got one question uh on my private screen. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, I will I'll without taking name I'll I'll, I'll just uh read through the question. So the question was 
uh, that I mentioned about leadership and management skills. And so someone asked, why do, why do we need to learn those skills as, as, as actuaries? So I thought maybe I'll also answer it publicly uh, for the benefit of everyone. Now, <clears throat> you heard me, you heard Isa as well. Uh, you heard Isa uh, talking about him being only 26 year old, but yet he was able to manage eight senior people, uh, uh, senior in terms of age uh, with him. So imagine if you hadn't developed or learned those leadership skills, you would have immediately failed. You know, people would put the age pressure on you, saying that you're too young, you're too new. Who are you to tell me? You know, so when it comes to management and leadership skills, these are skills you need to learn because eventually you do not want to get stuck in front of your Excel, become a lifelong uh, technical guy sitting behind the desk. You want to grow. Uh, when you become from an actuarial analyst, to an actuary, you will be doing a whole lot of things. You know, as an actuary, yes, you will be responsible for doing the calculations and stuff. But to be honest, you will not be the one doing the calculations. You, the calculations will be done by people who are now graduates, you know, who are doing the exams, who are learning. So those are the people who will produce the numbers, who will do the calculations, who will run the models, just like the state that you and I are in right now, uh, those of us who are, who are starting the actual journeys, okay? So you will be reporting to the actuaries who are already qualified. So their role is to evaluate numbers and then to be able to lobby any change or any development or any uh, changes that are meant for the CEO to, to handle. And, and if you do not have those skills, then it will be a problem for you. So that's where leadership comes in when you are given that role. So like I said in my in my earlier statements, uh, my CEO of Metropolitan Life Insurance was an actuary by qualification. So the only time he got to become a CEO is because he took time to develop his leadership skills. He learned these things and even management because now there are people under you who are reporting. Uh, probably who are older than you in the case of Isa, in the case of even uh, at the time when he was my CEO, he was 35 years old. Uh, right now I'm 35 already, you know, so he was CEO already at that time, but he had people building, uh, built under he, him who are senior to him in terms of age, but yet he was the boss. So you need to develop this uh, management and leadership skills because you want to grow to a higher corporate ladder skill uh, or role in the near future. Uh, I hope that helps to answer the question uh, that I got uh, on my private chat. Um, but I'm hoping that we get more questions from participants. I can see we are, we are a lot now. We are 22. So let's hear something. So, 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 so I also got uh, a direct message, I guess, and um, I'm, I'm in a direct question. And uh, yeah, the, the question was like, which universities do um, want to get uh, exempted, right? So far uh, <clears throat> from, from UK where I did my master's, uh, pretty much like uh, almost all the universities, they, they are like accredited by uh, Akshira Institute of UK. So basically when you do your master's there, you will you are master's or undergrad and you you, uh, you meet the, the, the requirement, like you have like a required pass mark, then you will definitely have an opportunity to get exempted. Um, so to add on, as other people are bringing in, I think because others were late, just to add on on the overall process of exemption. So to, there are two ways you could get exempt, exempted. Either you study at an accredited university, which will definitely be either in Australia, South Africa, UK. There are several universities that you could look into which are have joined in with the association. So you, once you study, say, a master's bachelor degree, then you directly get exempted um, 
a couple of exams, you see. Uh, but again, just to insist from, I, I personally got exempted for, for on, on an exam, INCR. Um, and Joseph, I think uh, most of you must, must also know um, Joseph Nyange. We all got exempted of CB1. Um, that was after we sat for a couple of exams and we thought, okay, um, you know, there are a couple of FNs that we studied in University of Dar es Salaam, you know, that we could actually get exemption for CB1. So say, um, I would speak of Udism because that's where I studied my bachelor degree. So say FN200. So we took those outlines of FN200, FN202, FN102, FN the accounting, you know, um, third year also we studied FN310, you know, all those just combined that was out. We reached out to um, one of the UDBS, I've forgotten his name, but he taught FN. I reached out to um, the FN102. So, you mean you just collect all these course outlines? It's just a, ma a matter of taking um, a step to do it. So, I believe you can all do it. It's really easy. Um, once you apply for it, you match the course outlines from U University of Dar es Salaam, you match them with the um, CB1 syllabus and you show, okay, you studied FN2, one or two, one, two, three things that are also in the CB1 exam. So once they just look into it, they are comfortable, then they'll definitely give you the exemption. Afterwards, they'll give you um, like a couple of time for you to play. And then, yeah, you go. So, um, a link that can also give you more um, a list of universities with relevant exemption. So you can look into that and probably as time moves on, you can take an advantage of that, you know, to study mm, um, your, for your most, I think, bachelor and master's degree um, abroad and you'll get a couple of exemptions. So take a step to also look into your UDism and IFM syllabuses. Those course outlines that you're given by teachers, just put record of them because they could be important. We applied for CB1, but probably you, you guys could also apply for say, um, maybe CB2, someone else could apply for CS1. It's just about give, making the step to do it and they have no reason not to give you the exemption. Um, any other questions? Feel free to, you know, like open up your video or, um, and any other alumni, you know, with experience, either one of our teachers, I, I cannot, not all of you, some have different names, but you can obviously greet and just experience as well. So what about the CAA exams? So I gave a link, maybe I should share it again, but I, I shared a link before someone asked a similar question. So it's a shorter route and it's great as well. Um, the IFOA decided to launch a shorter route to the IFOA. I think it only has, um, module zero to module six, no, module five, and maybe some professional exams to do. So it's, it's a, yeah, it's a great route. And if you take that route, I think you could get exemptions from either equivalent. So I shared the link that links up the FOA exams to the CA exam, but both of them are 
are great routes as well. So you could look into, I, I'm just looking for the link so I could share again. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I received the, another question here, like someone is asking, I think uh, probably uh, she is not even aware about the churro. So she just want a, a quick brief about what is it and what it does. And yeah, maybe she might be interested to even start doing the exam. So maybe a quick brief. Um, do you mind responding to that or? Myself. I think you're you a fresh, fresh, fresh ambassador for F4. You might give more. <laughs> uh, I just answering another one so you can just proceed. Yeah, so, well, so maybe I can give an example, right? Um, so think of um, maybe you have a car, right? And um, you definitely have to buy an insurance to protect your car, I guess, probably um, to be stolen or even to cause damage to other people. So what you'll do is uh, you'll go down there and <laughs> buy an insurance cover from an insurance company, right? So um, you pay, let's say, a certain amount of money, X, and you, the insurance company tells you, hey, uh, whatever will happen to your car, we're gonna like uh, probably refund you or you, we're gonna like give you a certain amount of money. So like, so actually comes in on the, uh, that part of developing that whole insurance contract, right? I mean, uh, trying to think about all the possibilities, right? Like what are the chances that this car will like crash or what the chance that this, car will probably cause damage to a third party. So for example, as an actuary, I will be interested with like the car model, I will be interested with like the age of the driver, I'll be interested with like uh, where does the car uh, does uh, ride and stuff like that. So based on this information, I will then sit down and calculate um, like what are, what are the chances that this car will crash, right? If I will, probably based on the age, maybe this person is like between 20 to let's say early 30s, uh, or maybe late 20s, I don't know, like this person will probably be drunk most of the time, he or she will be driving very carelessly and there are more chances that he or she can cause a lot of uh, maybe crash or, you know, like any, any accident may happen. So I will say, well, this person uh, is probable, he probably he will have so he will cause the accident, which means that as insurance will have to pay out some money, right? So as an actuary, I will have to kind of like price this a little bit higher, right? So then I will give uh, this driver a price that he or she have to pay right now so that whatever, whenever this car get crashed or cause the credit part damage, then we, we're going to compensate so in, in nutshell, it's like uh, actuaries are the people who are like interested with the events that we are not really sure if they will happen. So like we are into probable events. And what we do is like we try to use data to estimate the likelihood of those events happening. And based on those estimations, we can then uh, kind of like calculate how much someone should probably pay for that particular event so that whenever that uh, risk uh, happen in the future, then uh, we can compensate, right? So th that's pretty much what actuaries uh, do. So you can think the same way as your health insurance, right? You you pay monthly certain amount of money, but this uh, health insurance company doesn't really know when you're gonna fall sick, but they know probably you're gonna fall sick a couple of times, maybe twice or thrice a year. So they then, based on that, they know the, how much it costs you to get medication and therefore they charge you a certain amount of money that will really cover up that. And again, in actual, it's more of like low large number, you know, like possibly out of a hundred people who buy insurance from a particular company, maybe 1% of those people will definitely get into troubles. And therefore um, you can use the contribution from other people to compensate some of them and the rest of the money will be the profit to an insurance company. So it's more of 
playing around law of large number, calculating the probability of something happening, and also playing around with uh, discount, I uh, mean, pricing the, the stuffs and developing a very robust contract for people like those car driver or yourself for your insurance or a lot of things. That is just an example in insurance, but we do a lot of stuff in uh, cybersecurity. So you can think of like, a, like Facebook, for example, there might be a risk that people will hack their, 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 their website and take some data there. So they have to buy an insurance to cover those possibilities. Uh, in investment as well, there are risks that maybe uh, the bond might, like uh, maybe a government is borrowing money from people, there is a chance that the government will default. So maybe a bank is trying to buy those bonds, they have to sit down and calculate what is the likelihood maybe the government will default. The same applies to a bank lending to you will want to know what is the likelihood that you will default, you will fail to pay, you will fail to pay your, your money back and from there, they can know with some sort of degree that this is uh, what is going to happen. Or like myself, I'm interested with what is the likelihood that a person will die in that particular period of time. And by knowing that I can then develop some retirement products like annuities or pensions based on that. So that's pretty much what we do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, I think it should be really clear to that um, person and anyone else. Um, we have another question from Daniel. Thank you. Um, is Capital Market one of the places you would recommend students to seek opportunities for their career growth in actuarial science? Um, yeah, so. Um, I don't know who wants to take that question between, I'm not sure if Isa is still here, Isa or, or Sandeep, please. You can take Daniel's question. Surely, um, but I would also want maybe Isa to comment because uh, it comes from a regulatory side. So most definitely, if you get an opportunity with capital markets, I would definitely recommend that you take that up as soon as possible. Um, Capital markets will, will be developing a lot of products in the near future. We need the financial landscape of Tanzania to change. And only with the actuaries inputs is where <clears throat> you will get to shape that. Uh, perhaps not immediately as you graduate because you might not have a lot of experience to, to guide uh, the senior regulators. Uh, but definitely because of your Perhaps uh, what I assume is that you you are reading a lot of things on, on LinkedIn. You are reading and exposing yourself to a lot of things that are going outside uh, in your typical environment outside Tanzania. So these are things that you need to learn, uh, be constantly abreast of. And I believe with that, you will be able to influence uh, changes within the Tanzania's capital markets uh, development area. We need a lot of things like for example, for the Dar es Salaam Stock Exchange, we have seen uh, the Nairobi Stock Exchange bringing in products like uh, derivatives, you know, but this is yet to happen in Tanzania. So why not? Uh, can't we use modeling to, to see uh, what can go wrong, what are the risks? And that's where input is required from uh, actual people. Uh, like I said, you might not have the experience to do so initially, but uh, the fact that you can give this idea and if they take it up, you will get to be involved in the development of this. Uh, there's also something that Isa can talk about. Um, I forget the name, but it's about uh, reinsurance uh, placement on the capital markets. Uh, it's something, a project that they were working on with someone called Anselmi. Uh, I think if Isa is still around, he can talk about it. But yeah, definitely something that you can, you should participate in. Uh, there's also something called a regulatory sandbox where they create special regulations uh, to allow development of certain products for test or pilot purposes, because the current regulations may not allow. For example, if you wanted to deal with cryptocurrencies and how to bring about changes in, in blockchain in Tanzania, and you will have to involve 
the capital markets uh, team as well because they need to develop special regulations to allow for new startups in this field if we wanted to bring in blockchain companies they will need to fall under the mandate of the capital markets uh, bot so your involvement in this area will definitely be helpful and this way you grow as well so i don't know if it's as around then we can add on to it yes sir I think he's around. I can see this is this should be him. Um, Isa. Maybe you know, I can add a, like very, very small part that even some students who are who are probably still in their first year or second year, they can start working on. Like you can just think of like things like bonds, right? So with bond, uh, like which is uh, one of like very popular financial product in Tanzania right now, well, you, you can still buy bonds. But with bonds, they say, oh, in general, it's risk-free, but definitely there's still some risk. For example, uh, one of the biggest risk is two, at least is political risk. And the second one is, uh, is like uh, inflation risk, right? Because like given the situation right, like right now, we don't know really the future. And you know, with COVID, it will affect a lot of things from agriculture to business and stuff. So for sure, we don't really know what will happen on things like prices and stuff. So probably we might uh, get into like unexpected inflation and so on. So right now, anyone who is buying uh, bonds in Tanzania, obviously he or she is accepting inflation risk with no any way to hedge himself against that. So one possible area that like young people, like first year, second year, they can uh, really work on is just to develop um, some sort of like inflation index that they can probably be traded from commercial banks, right? When you buy your bonds, maybe you are you are sure that you're gonna get fifteen percent, but one percent of it it's okay to go for to cover your inflation rate, and you are you're sure that you're gonna receive something um, very valuable, what in whatever uh, horizon in the future. So, yeah. Um, thank you guys, I appreciate it. I think Isa left, I uh, can confirm that. So another question is from Ayub, before I read a, a thankful text from Del Gratis is, how is actual skilled students um, in the world of self-employment? Um, I assume the question is the opportunities around self-employment. So our panelists, please. You don't want me to respond to that? <laughs> okay. Oh, you will. That's an impressive question. Thank you. Um, so th there are a bunch of things that you can do as an actuary beyond uh, like looking for a job, right? So there are a hell of things. As Sandeep was mentioning, our financial market is still like very undeveloped. So there are a lot of opportunities that you can take uh, control of. So one is maybe you can think around uh, like credit risk. Uh, so you can work on things like developing credit risk score. You can develop models for a lot of um, like like microfinancing in Tanzania. People they just lend into each other without really knowing what is the likelihood this person will default or will not pay back. So you find out people that like they're complaining at the end of the day. But for example, right now there are a lot of hell of open source data that with credit information. So you can play around with that put in some sort of like uh, predictive models like machine learning, try to kind of like figure out what is the likelihood. And then you can have like a very robust models that you can roll out to say all microfinance in Tanzania, even banks themselves, I guess, they are not really using any advanced ways of telling the likelihood of someone defaulting. That's one. Two is like the insurance product. Well, I can see some innovation going on right now, but still I'm sure there, are, there should be like more smart ways of selling and delivering and offering the insurance product in Tanzania. So you can also look at that. Um, uh, what else? Um, yeah, cyber is still an open problem right now and it's becoming like very big risk. So you can also, a couple of days, big companies were hacked recently. So you can think about how you develop like insurance cover for those people. So I will say uh, actually they have like a massive, massive uh, space for innovating, coming up with uh, like new uh, solutions. And if I were you, I would probably choose that path if you are 
uh, that bold and enough to take um, a massive risk. So yeah, and again, remember there is a huge space in climate change as well. Everything is changing. So you can dive in as well, develop like risk. Um, think of like this job is coming up right now, but I'm telling you, there is no, I'm sure like more than 90% of the businesses, they're not really insured against that. So if this uh, um, cyclone, for example, damage a lot of uh, less infrastructure or buildings, or businesses for sure it will be like a, a big outcry there. So yeah, so I, I guess there are a lot of opportunities to that and I'll be happy to chat with you and even share with you some ideas or even work together in case if you're interested. And uh, yeah, so yeah, so we can talk more uh, later for that. Thank you. Okay. Um... So there's another question uh, from Daniel, actually too. Um, we have seen good number of people who at first started attending actual professional exams <laughs> and later on switched to attending other professional exams like CFA, FRM. What's your opinion on this? Um, yeah. Um, okay. Sandeep, you wanna look at, take this one? exams question <laughs> you you take it better but yeah um i don't mind giving my opinion on this one uh well it, it depends on on circumstances you see people probably students are frustrated that they're not getting enough actual jobs so probably going through the same phase that i went through uh like you you heard me if 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 the person was asking the question if they were around they should have heard me saying that uh, in my initial years when I started working for Heritage, my job was nothing related to actuarial. Uh, it was very minimal. I was the one making my own initial efforts to, to bring uh, analytics and actuarial uh, inputs to management is when I got a little bit of opportunity and exposure. Uh, but earlier on, it was just basic jobs. So I was going through that frustration at the time. and. Probably this comes from, uh, and you're asking this because there are students who may have expressed or or, or felt this uh, and thought maybe if I shift to CFA or if I shift to the other professions, some people have already also turned into accountants, you know, they are doing SCCA papers now. So it's definitely your environment where you think maybe there are more opportunities. So there's no harm in that. Uh, the fact that you stepped into the actual world and you did some exams or maybe you graduated, it means you possess those analytical uh, skills. I feel that is more important. You know, when you have that, you will eventually make a good career for yourself. Uh, whether you continue being under CFA or under risk management, you will still become the person you, you wanted to become in, in, in areas of... Uh, financial industry so it's not a bad thing to to shift uh, doing other exams if you see there are opportunities also depends on what you aim in your life is it the money that you're going for as a salary of a qualified actuary or are, are you going for opportunities or is your dream perhaps to change the financial landscape of tanzania and how you can impact so no harm in changing i think i, I would be okay if someone changed but if you can still pursue the future is very bright for actuaries. Uh, there's a lot more coming for us, uh, especially once the regulator starts pinning down the insurance companies. I think this is very important and I think everyone must listen. Uh, when the regulator, TIRA, starts to pin the insurance companies to have an actuarial department and acts very strongly uh, on that requirement is when you will see a lot of employment coming for actuaries and then they will never feel the need to shift doing another exam. Yeah. So I think that's important. Let's keep going. Uh, if you can change area, Sorry, are you, can you mute yourself? Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Um, um, just one last question. Probably it's time for people to go and pray as well. Um, is there a chance that AI will replace actuaries? Um, Salvatore, if you mind, don't mind, I mean. Oh, I mean, uh, Daniel, I guess this is a pretty hard question, but um, definitely I can say um, in a way, uh, AI and machine learning will, will does uh, replace a lot of works because like what this machine learning, for example, does is like, we, we do automate a lot of, of stuff. So, so I, 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 I still feel like actually we'll still have roles there. But what they need to do really is just to update themselves with this new. Uh... Yeah. Okay, so I guess I can continue, right? So, so, so I guess uh, what we need to do really is just to update ourselves with the new skills on AI and machine learning, just to be uh, relevant with the current uh, development in, in, in this space. But definitely uh, AI and uh, machine learning will, does a lot of work for, for us. For example, things around um, like um, car insurance, uh, things like auto, auto, automatic, uh, automated cars. So a lot of things gonna really change. But what we need to do is like to, to appreciate that AI and uh, machine learning, they're really, really important in, in actual science. And we learn a lot of these stuff because at the end of the day, these AIs and machine learning, they are, they are like not self-made. It's things that we're gonna do them. And in order to do this stuff, you must have uh, both skills in actuarial as well as uh, data science. So I guess the best thing to do right now is not worry much, but to be updated and learn these skills and see how we can apply them in, I mean, in whatever we, we are working on. But it's very, very, uh, promising area that we really need to put a lot of efforts on. Pretty much everything is uh, machine learning and AI currently after you have your basic skills on actual. Thank you. And if I may add to that, uh, I, I don't think so they will, AI will, will replace actuaries as such uh, because when, when you talk about being an actuary, you are at a level where you are also making very good decisions. Yeah. So the AI and the machine learning will produce a lot of technical stuff for you. You know, all the modeling, all the predictions, all the likelihood of things happening. So it will do all the mathematical things for you. But then at the end of the day, it is you as the actuary who's reading those results, who has to interpret those to make sense of whether the model that you used for your artificial intelligence and machine learning, are they making sense? Uh, are they relevant to the Tanzanian market? You know, it could produce results that are suitable in other markets maybe, but not in Tanzania. So as an actuary is where your input, your sense of your environment, your sense of your politics will come in to play and shape. And then again, you as an actuary will need to convince your senior management, your CEO, perhaps even the board, uh, where you translate the results of AI and machine learning right up to the board. So your job will always be there in decision-making, development, new idea generation is where you will come in. So no, I don't think so. AI will replace us. AI will just equip us more. We will be better equipped. Uh, we will feel more confident. You know, it's like uh, the time of era of horse riding, uh, moving from point A to B to now having a car, moving from point A to B. It, it did not replace <laughs> any humans. It's yeah. just a tool, a means to an end, yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe you might be replaced if you don't know a bit of AI and machine learning, but yeah. You, <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, guys. And just to also add, um, I think to to just justify as well that you would not be replaced. The IFO has also um, started a data science qualification, um, which you could also look into. Uh, I believe it will make you uh, progress in terms of um, making yourself uh, aware of 
all this data science, data analysis and issues in terms of like career. So if you want your career uh, to progress around that area, you can uh, you can look into that one. I'll look if I can share a link before we leave, but, but yeah. And I don't think if there are any more questions. Uh, there was a thank you note from Del Gratis. On behalf of others, he just appreciates um, us arranging and he's asking if we can arrange to have this one any other time. Um, yeah, thank you as well, Del Gratis. But I also, I also wish that we could, um, maybe if you guys arrange this next time for yourself so we can have uh, those who weren't able to attend today and then we can look into inviting even um, a wider panel next time uh, because we had more students registered around 70 and we only had 22 so we're wondering <laughs> what has happened but we are grateful and really we appreciate for those who are able to attend and so thank you for your thank you not so next time if leaders i think olive i saw olive here and maybe one from IFM, if you guys can arrange, if you want this next time, then you can definitely cont uh, contact us. I think Issa, Sandeep, we have all left our contacts and you all have um, our emails as well. So you can reach out to us and we'll see. If yeah. uh, and Nema, please, uh, if you can, uh, I see it's being recorded. So maybe you can share a recorded version uh, on Google Drive and then we can spread it all right uh, to all our forums the actual society and and maybe to students who are not part of the actual society of tanzania whatsapp group and the facebook group uh, to become part of it and if you're already part of it then tell someone who's not part of it to become part of it uh, those who are in this domain we need as many people as we can so that if there's any opportunities we are quickly informing uh, other students so two things, the WhatsApp and, and the Facebook as well. Thank you. Um, so if this is your admin, if you could also share the WhatsApp group link here. Uh, but in the meantime, I would like to maybe just one of those before we maybe just say um, an overall, um, you know, thank you not to um, as a panelist. Come again. Uh, name I couldn't hear you properly. Yeah, if you could just give a thank you not uh, an overall um, thank you not from you and from Salvatore before we close. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> definitely. So uh, th thank you, uh, students who attended. Uh, I'm sure there are some who have left already. But those who are still around, uh, we appreciate uh, you took time to listen to us, uh, took maybe encouragement from us, and you also asked very good questions, which helped others as well. So I've left my email address on the chat forum, and I'm also available on the WhatsApp group, or you can post something on, on the Actual Society of Tanzania Facebook group. Uh, we are always accessible. You can drop me a message ask me questions, then uh, let's share ideas and let's learn together. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Nema, for asking me to be part of the panel. I really feel honored. Asante. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, so from my end, again, thanks everyone for, for showing up. I, I know you have a very busy schedule, uh, busy uh, timetables, but thanks for, for, for showing up. Uh, what I would just uh, advise everyone is like, uh, we keep pushing. I, I know some some of, of you or some of us, we, we get like very discouraged uh, when we think about uh, becoming an actuary. It, it seems like it's a very long journey, but trust me, it's 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 long, but it's, it's a very incredible journey. Myself, uh, I just find it like very, very, uh, interesting. So I think it's a journey that you you just have to like embark on and try to learn as much as you can. And I'm sure the skills that you you wanna be, uh, you know, you're gonna get along the the, the way will be uh, pretty uh, very pretty useful. 
and trust me uh, as you can see like currently the world is facing a lot of uh, challenges like covid uh, a lot of different political issues uh, and the world is getting even more competitive and we are getting more challenges like longevity coming in so uh, the, the skills uh, issue like cyber security and stuff like that so the role of actuaries they uh, they're becoming more clearer as the, the, uh, as we get into the future so i will recommend everyone to, to really try is her very best to uh, get on this journey and together i'm sure we're gonna play a big part in innovating our financial market and making like tanzania like the, the, the greatest economy but because like actually the future of the economy really depends on how active the financial market is and our financial market for the time being is still like very undeveloped so i believe you guys you are pretty genius and you are the ones who are gonna be like getting in and innovate as much as you can because Myself, I get so much inspired when I look at like some some big banks like JP Morgan. So you can see like how they come up with very very innovative innovative products like swaps and stuff. So trust me, actually, is very interesting, and you are rolling changing the way of uh, financial market works. Is it's gonna be like very uh, much needed. So please stay on the journey and keep pushing, and let's get it done together. And don't forget to claim for your exemptions based on your undergrad either from UDSM or IFM, reach NEMA, tailor your application pretty well and push. Don't forget as well to be as aggressive as you can. Push IFO, they will give it for you. Uh, they, they will do it for you. And also try as much as you can to push for scholarship applications, Commonwealth, Chevenin, uh, and the others. Or if you can fund yourself, go out there, get more exemptions and the journey will be much easier. So yeah, thanks a lot. My email is here, I guess. And uh, we can also keep in touch in case you might be interested. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, everyone. Um, thank you, Sia, for being part of this. Thank you, Salvatore. Thank you, Sandeep. Again, I truly appreciate all of you who have been able to attend. We'll share the recording. And again, as they said, if you need anything, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we have reached the end of our webinar. and. Yeah, goodbye. Thanks Thank a lot, Nema. Thanks a lot. Questions. Yeah. Yeah, Sandeep, I truly appreciate your time. No problem, Nema. Thank you very much. Sandeep, to talk about it. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Okay, cheers.